So we covered kind of a lot of space already. We've realized this space is kind of really, really broad, really, really deep as well. And um, uh, we were just talking kind of during the break, the way that we set up the conference today is to really cover that middle ground uh, that somehow is a little bit missing in our country. We either have really high academic uh, discussions about the nature of the modern media and the meaning and everything else. Uh, and then on the other hand, we've got lots of professional conferences. We talk about really professional um, uh, operational things such as, okay, best strategies and tactics to do Instagram marketing, things like that. But this kind of layer that we're discussing today is sort of kind of missing, that connecting point between uh, the, the, the theory and the practice. And as they say, my, one of my favorite phrases is that theory uh, without, uh, without practice is uh, impotent and practice without theory is blind. And we're actually today trying to be both uh, not blind and not impotent if we can. So this panel is sort of an expression of that as well. We're going to have kind of a mix of different people. We're going to have academics and business people uh, uh, talking about how digital and the ubiquitousness of digital is actually changing how they do things and how they actually see the impact of these new dynamics onto the world and onto our country as well. And the panel is going to be moderated by uh, uh, Danica Chigoya, who is a, a docent at uh, the Faculty of Media and Communications. Danica, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start uh, with presenting you the speakers, then I will just say a few words about my aspects in the uh, digital field, and then we will hear some really great small and big narratives about digital technologies uh, today. Uh, today with us are uh, Professor Aleksandar Fatic from the Institute of Philosophy and Social Theory and also Faculty of Media and Communication, uh, Goran Tomka, uh, professor at Faculty of Sport and Tourism in Novi Sad and uh, UNESCO Chair in Cultural Policy and Management. Uh, famous Branimir Brkljač, story maker and founder of Mokrin House. And uh, our uh, Uroš Krčedinac, young professor from Faculty of Media and Communications. So this is our team for today. And uh, I wanted to uh, highlight few news uh, which were in media uh, mainstream media and uh, also social media, uh, like the main news in last few days. Uh, one of it is uh, Notre Dame, and why is it now interesting to see how that uh, how that some happen so something that happened in uh, which is really terrible, like a fire in Notre Dame, uh, can now be interesting for digital world. And y yesterday, when I was preparing my uh, teaching for the next week, I found a news, uh, actually a text, that where is written that uh, uh, digital scans will probably the best help, uh, will be the best help for the ar architects uh, while they uh, try to rebuild the burned cathedral. So we have to now have a little bit of uh, thinking about is it really uh, only the digital uh, scan something that help or the architects uh, also have something that is already printed and made by hand before, earlier, and uh, et cetera. Uh, also one interesting happened, uh, something interesting happened yesterday. If someone is a fan of football or watch football, you, had, you, you, could, be, uh, you could see a game between Manchester City and Tottenham. And uh, at the end of the game, maybe there was like a few minutes until the end, uh, the score was 4-3 for, uh, for, uh, for uh, Manchester City and they needed one more goal to go to the semi-final. Uh, they won, they, they won the, goal, the goal, but uh, something happened. What? The referee went to one room and saw uh, a video of the offside and there were no goals. So uh, now, if someone doesn't know, uh, the rules of the sports, the rules of the football change because of the digital technology, because we now have something which is called VAR. It is Video Referee Assistant or Assistant Referee. Uh, and uh, you see how something that is digital can change something that is completely analog, like sport. And that's something that Lazar said at the beginning. So everything is now uh, in the digital era. So it's, it's maybe uh, my speak is, may my speak is maybe um, something that belongs to history because now I, when I see media, I all the time think how something changed. But 
the change already happened, so maybe we could speak about the future, what will now bring and how can we deal with something that will come, not what it is now. And so that's just the two examples. I have more, but I, I think that it will be better for you to listen our great speakers here. And I would like to start from Uros Kaczadinets, uh, because he's also a host like, like uh, myself here. So please, Uros, tell me uh, what is your aspect and how can you deal with the digital, the post-digital era? How do you understand all the things that happened uh, here around us and maybe in our minds? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Danica, and thank you all for being here, being at the Faculty of Media and Communications. And uh, first of all, I, I like the name of the conference, Post Digital. Like, um, we live in this totally digitized world, and yet we still, um, somehow I see it as a, as a form of, of this subtle and sweet um, provocation. Because if everything is digital, then what is Post Digital? But still, it reminded me of a, of a um, news story I read a couple of, couple of uh, days ago, I think it was on New York Times, I was not sure, about, um, about the, the, the rich people in the Silicon Valley, like the, the tech uh, barons of the Silicon Valley, they send their children to private school, schools without technology. And technology is basically on the rise for the middle class and for the, for the, for the lower classes. And the lower you are, at the, at the social hierarchy in the, in the United States, uh, the bigger the chances are that you're going to spend more time in front of a screen. So digitization is something that is, in the America, if we want to, you know, uh, be, uh, be a little bit uh, like to play with words, to say that digitization is something for the middle classes and for the lower classes and for the upper classes, they don't need digitization because they believe that children are going to be better managers and they're going to be better leaders of the societies in future if they grow up without screens in front of them. So this is something we have to keep in mind when talking about this digitization. And this is a big problem, especially here uh, at the periphery of the global system, because here uh, there are a lot of people, a lot of smart and good people who think that digitization is some sort of panacea, some sort of a like a universal solution for all the problems. Like our schools are, are in danger and our schools are problematic in so many ways, so we should bring computers to them and these computers are going to solve problems. And I think uh, that, okay, I, I mean, I have a PhD in software engineering, so I, I know what, what computers can do. And I like computers. I'm not speaking from this position of technophobia and from this like, uh, uh, like strict criticism, but I think that computers cannot be uh, the answer as themselves. We need to think more. I think that we live in a world with, uh, with a sufficit of uh, technological development, but the, the deficit of um, reflection and articulation and thinking, and I think that we need more like data humanities and data arts and stuff like that to really be able to think about the world that we are, that we are creating. And one of the things for the post-digital age that I think it's, the, it's, it's really important, especially important if we talk about all this like data humanities and data arts is, is data as means of production. And this is something, uh, this is something the, the Israeli philosopher and historian Harari said, like data is the new means of production. It's not the land, it's not factories, it's data. So who owns this data and who controls this data and to what what is the world that is being controlled with, the, with all this new, new, new resource that data is? Like, uh, we still don't know how to talk about that. We need conferences like this in order to create like, places where we're going to discuss, discuss, discuss data as, as resource. This data that we leave on Facebook, for example, should it belong to us? Should it belong to Facebook? Should it belong to, uh, to a nation state? Should it belong to, I don't know, European Union? United States, United Nations, should it be public? Should it be something that's like uh, collectively managed? We still don't know how to, how to talk about these things because it's so complicated. And it involves a lot of technical knowledge, it involves a lot of like uh, social understanding, and uh, this is why I believe conferences like this are of utter importance, to have a, to have a space to discuss these sort of things. Thank you, Uros. Thank you, Uros. Uh, now, um Let's call Pranimir to see what can you say in this uh, theoretical or your practical work in digital world. 
Uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to uh, go into the theory because I think we have a lot, enough professors here who, who can give you this theory uh, background of that. Uh, but uh, I think it's good to combine what, what is theory and what, what is uh, practice and what is, uh, because we live in the world, uh, in a completely new world, uh, without knowing what are the consequences of, the, of living in that world. Um, I'm coming from the business background um, and uh, what I can see how marketing and advertising industry change in, in just last decade or 15 years is dramatic, so dramatic that basically that industry, uh, how to say it nicely, doesn't exist anymore? No. <laughs> um, it exists, but uh, it's uh, on the exit uh, of, 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 of that. The reason is uh, that the media context change. If you think what customer was at the beginning, it was someone in, in, in the world of limited media channels. The role of media was to bring people in front of the media, whether you're reading newspapers or listening radio or watching television. The role of advertising was to interrupt that experience and communicate with those people trying to convince them to buy your product. So you respect your customer, okay, in a way. Now when every one of us is a media channel, with this device in our pocket. We are all media channels. We are producing and consuming the media. That role of traditional media or media agency changed completely. So now the role of those who have some products, it's not just to convince everybody. They need to identify who among all of us are more likely to buy our product. Uh, and the consequence of that was that the brands start to uh, give you the stories, uh, to, to tell you the stories, and media platforms, basically those tech companies, who now are trying to understand what, who you are. And those technolog technology companies and those media platforms start to uh, treat you as a product. So you are the product that they sell to those advertisers. But we are going even lower now because with this uh, more and more smart devices around us, which are just a new touch points of who we are, uh, we stop being just the product. We start becoming the raw material. We go be below the product itself. We are now raw material based on that. They pack it and, and sell it further. I don't know what is our next step in that, but we are at the same time raw material and the object of, of, of that uh, communication. So that's completely new world in which you are trying to sell the product. So the whole industry, advertising and marketing, is just, I'll say, disappearing because whatever we are doing, this is marketing. How to handle that? I really don't know. Maybe Goran knows, or he has something completely he, different. He knows for sure. <laughs> for sure, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I have. Hello, everyone. I have every um, actually quite a different angle that I would like to share with you, and um, I would like to start with um, this theory of late Pierre Bourdieu, who talked about how we, the middle classes, um, in the late 90s, basically have the feeling that we are losing our social and political role, that we are becoming a bit obsolete, the knowledge, no one cares, and so on and so on. And what he says, in order to regain this feeling of freedom, of movement, and so on, we are dreaming of this weightlessness or weightless society. We have these weightless dreams. So dreams of ideas, of innovation, of the digital, of the immaterial stuff and so on, that we can move freely, that we are not defined by the land, by the blood, by the flesh, by the stones, by the, you know, all the things that surround us, but we somehow want to transcend this, these material boundaries and feel free and relevant to this world again. 
And if we follow some of the Bourdieuian uh, sociologists who did research in actually students of culture and media and arts management and so on, and this is us in the room, we basically come from these social circles. So we are into ideas, we are not fond of material stuff and so on. Um, now, why I think this is important is that this, our social and political place in our societies, actually create us ignorant of all the heavy material stuff that are living around us. And this is going to be basically a really short materialist critique of what we heard so far. And if we talk about matter, one um, thing that we have to, um, how to say, uh, observe around us is the carbon. All that we are living with now, this table, this microphone, this you know, sweater, everything, the phones, the whole digital thing, is made out of carbon. And is made out of carbon that has been deposited in our Earth for millions of years. And basically what we are seeing now is the end of the carbon party. So we have come to the moment that we, the party is over. But it's important to understand also that that party produced a lot of material wealth, but that party also produced the ideas that we now deal with. Because if you think about humanism, individualism, even modern ideas of national state, of media, of communication, of everything, this is all has been produced after we have discovered carbon as this super calorie rich intensive energy that we can just use and have this party. So all our ideas are based on, on the carbon. Now what happens when another post thing happens, and this is post carbon society, when this peak oil as ecologists call it, when it ends, what happens then? And one of the things definitely that, that happen is that things slow down. Um, we travel less, we move less, we communicate less, for sure. But one of the important things that I, uh, that I guess is obvious that happens is rediscovery of other forms of life that we are actually very dependent on, even though we don't think about them. You know, the, these uh, strange things called plants that we actually eat, uh, but they're not digital, so that's not so uh, interesting to think about them. But actually, this is very anthropocentric, and this has been a part of a really now the contemporary critique of everything that we do as social scientists and so on. Like, how can we think of the world in which we don't think only about humans? And now, that's sorry for, for this, but um, I just had to use your text as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a discourse. When, for example, you quoted Raymond Williams saying that um, the technological determinism um, evacuates human agency, or that whatever we as humans do, the th things will uh, continue or not continue, and so on. Now, what is important in this cr anthropocentric critique is that it's not anymore only important what we as humans do. It's important what rocks do, what suns do, what winds do, what plants do. I know I, I, I sound hippie, but I think it's really important that we even thinking about media, start thinking about these new form, new forms, other forms of life that are actually, that our material existence is very dependent on. And now the question is like, what's going to happen when we start, you know, when the oil gets really pricey, when the electricity gets pricey and so on. And I think that we can use our experience of the 90s, you know, in the 90s, here in Serbia, we have these power cuts for six hours, then 12 hours, then 18 hours, then 24 hours, and so on and so on. And what happens is that all of a sudden, everything is stuck. Everything is heavy. Everything is slow. Everything is so hard to do. And what we, what we try to do in this situation is like get away from that, run away from that into our weightless light dreams. But per approach that I particularly like is um, an approach of some of the um, object-oriented ontologists or philosophers, some of them living uh, next to goldsmiths and teaching at goldsmiths, who actually say that if we start thinking about the ontology of things and other forms of life, and if we enable other forms of life to receive the agency, so to be also political, social, economic, ecological actors, 
then we also start exploring things like time and space and our bodies, which we, which we basically forgot in the, in the decades of only tweeting and sharing and being, you know, crossing time and space. Now, what I'm trying to say is that um, I think that if we continue to ignore these heavy things, such as our bodies and plants and rocks, we might lose all the great things that we have won with the digital media revolutions and so on. So what, what my urge here is today is not to offer a solution, definitely not, because I don't have one, but basically to, to, to say uh, and to send an invitation or call to rethink a world in which we can use all the benefits of the digital values, of the freedom, of the fr free moving, of coming together and so on, but doing that with the heavy things around us. Um, and going back to the 90s in Serbia, I don't think that it's going to be a world in which we are, you know, back to Middle Ages, as someone, as some say. As Des uh, rightly pointed out, past is always present, so digital past is going to be present in the future. So we should protect and value these, 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 these rights, but basically on a different technology. Is it going to be solar plants or whatever? But I think for students and scholars of digital um, media and digital world, it's important to think how can we preserve the values of the digital world today without the technology and the energy that powers it because we are running out of it. Thank you. Okay, Goran knows. Now we, we, we heard that. Uh, I would just like to add that there is also one danger of thinking that we are preserving nature by uh, putting some clicks and likes into uh, actions that are only digital, like save the planet and then you just share and uh, like all the posts and you actually doesn't save it because after that you put your garbage somewhere that you don't have to or put some old phone out in, in the garbage and etc. But thank you, a very, very interesting focus. Uh, and Professor Alexander Fatic, Last but not the least, of course. Thank you, Danica, uh, and thank you all the introductory speakers. Uh, you've broached many uh, uh, key issues, and, and uh, I sort of weary myself and others on a number of, of those uh, on a continuing basis. And one of those queries is really about the nature of the expected or anticipated post-digital culture, post-digital age. How do we imagine the post-digital age? Lazar said that we now have a situation where everything is digital, and this situation in itself warrants a discussion of the upcoming post-digital, so the next change, the next transformation, the next step in the evolution of what is now a completely digital life. But how do we envisage that? Do we envisage that as becoming increasingly digitalized and surveyed and uh, circumscribed from all sides and not noticing this? Do we envisage the post-digital age as our inner transformation in the way that we no longer distinguish between the digital and what used to be analog? Or do we imagine the post-digital age as the abolition and the discontinuation of some of the practices of the digital life and the return to the more organic uh, forms of life. And you, you mentioned that a key word in your presentation was the word will. And uh, uh, to me, a key word in discussing this, this, this theme is really the word organic. Uh, uh, do, do, do we live lives, digital lives today, which uh, are completely severed from any contact with what used to be organic aspects of our lives, especially the organic aspects of our participation in important communities. Um, I have a 10-year-old daughter um, to whom it is extremely important how many followers she has on her YouTube channel. And one of the most important things in her social life and communication with her schoolmates is who has more likes on various posts on social networks. And we all witness situations where people are willing to go to extraordinary lengths to gather more likes on networks. And as, as a digitally 
illiterate person, I could never fully understand the importance of having more likes than somebody else. But apparently, there are industrial and, and commercial reasons for this. They, they escape me, but, but I'm sure they exist. Uh, but what, what, what sort of captures my attention constantly, the attention of a social scientist in me, is, is really what, uh, what kind of a price we are paying for, for the likes, for the, for the followers on, on social networks, and do we inculcate this awareness of a price that we are paying in our visualization of a post-digital age? We recently had a situation here where the Ministry of the Interior somewhat controversially ordered several thousand surveillance cameras, which they intended to uh, install across the city uh, on, on the rationale that they, are, they were to be used to prevent crime or monitor traffic and whatever. And, and, the, uh, and the controversy was about the way these cameras had been procured. My question was, my God, the 2,000 cameras, will they remember where they, where they put them so when we dismantle them that we can find them? I'm constantly thinking about the post-digital age in terms of uh, uh, there coming a time when we will be dismantling these horrible things. My friend Julian Savulescu, who is a bioethicist in Oxford, uh, recently said to me, that he uh, keeps counting cameras on his walk from his home to the university. And his last number, the last number of cameras that he could see was 400 and something. And apparently he lives a few hundred meters from, from where the place where he works. Uh, so this is digitization. This is, based, this is the everyday reality of our li lives. Uh, what has digitization done to the organic aspects of our identity and our lives in terms of uh, our uh, relationships to our communities? Do we, do we have communities? Today, everybody talks about digitization allowing fast contact with almost anyone on the planet. But if I can have a fast contact with anyone on the planet, does this mean that people who are close to me, sitting next to me, become less important to me? Uh, what does this, what sort of consequences does this generate for my concept of my social capital? Is my social capital my network on LinkedIn? Or is my social capital a, a network of organic relationships which I have with Dragana, with Danica, with people Jarko, with people around me? Now, uh, Eric Hughes Lehner made this famous distinction when he talked about social capital. Uh, he considered trust to be one of the bounding uh, types of social capital, one of the main uh, types of social capital. And he distinguished between what he calls strategic trust between people and moralistic trust. A strategic trust is trust which is sort of verifiable, which is mediated by institutions, which is mediated by procedures, by certificates, by all kinds of social procedures, which, which, which basically mean that when I meet Dragana, I don't need to trust her because she has an honest expression on her face, because I know that she wouldn't be here if she didn't have a PhD and was, if she hadn't been elected to a professorship and things like that. So this is strategic trust. This is trust which is increasingly warranted by uh, digital networks, by computer systems, by today, the word system is part of our everyday communication. When you go to, to, to a public office and they tell you that the system is down, everybody knows what it is. Even, even a person who's never uh, uh, worked on, on, on a computer, they all know that the system is the key thing without which no, but nothing can be done in, in dealing with the public administration. So the system allows me to have strategic trust in people around me, in the state, in the institutions. But Yuslaina says there's another type of trust which is perhaps more key to our identities in terms of uh, us being parts of our communities, and that is moralistic trust. That is the kind of trust which is a priori, which is, which is considered a virtue in a community. There are communities in which uh, distrustful individuals are, are, are viewed as suspicious, as people of dubious character, where, where people are expected to show trust to other people. And this is, 
This is one of those things that sort of remind us of what it used to be when we had a community, when we didn't have so many, uh, uh, so many ways to, to verify and certify the types of relationships we have uh, with other people. And one wonders whether we all become certifiable by insisting that everything, you know, everybody that whom we trust must, must be certified in this or that. This is a society of certification, ver verification, and, and a society of of system-mediated relationships between people, computer system-mediated relationships between people. So, so what is the post-digital age going to look like? Will we abolish our obsessive insistence on strategic trust, on verifications, on qualifications? Will we start remembering that those who sit next to us are more important than those who endorse us for so many skills on LinkedIn? and live somewhere on the other side of the planet. Will we dispense with this illusion that uh, 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 distance doesn't matter? Physical distance, moral distance, emotional distance, distance in identities. Will we consider to, will we, will we continue to consider uh, 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 any insistence on organic relationships as, as in a way reactionary way of thinking? Will we change in the post-digital age in the way in which we have changed by entering the digital age? And this is, I think, a, a question which will probably impact our quality of life the most. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting because I was thinking last days uh, how our lives are short, they are really when we see the history and the world and everything, our era is small when we are humans. And uh, if we think about that in the aspect of digital, we actually make it even shorter because we are all the time on our devices and we actually skip life and everything that can happen. But it doesn't have to be like that. I'm always in uh, thinking about self-control and how, how can we use digital technologies and not uh, give them an opportunity uh, to, to uh, them to, to use us as the humans. But now I would like uh, public uh, to, to have some questions for our uh, speakers. I think that uh, all four of them have great and different aspects, which is also very important for us here. Uh, so if you have any questions, they are, I know that they are delighted to, to give you some answers or to, to develop some interesting discuss discussion. Um, can I ask three questions, or do I have just one? You have okay, cool. three is fine. <laughs> so I do have one for Professor Kurchadinets. Um, when you were talking about the difference between the lower and the middle classes and the impact of the media for the lower and the middle classes, the study before Trump's elections was showing that basically the TV nation of the US that counts more than eight hours of watching TV per day exactly. was the nation that did elect the elites such as Donald Trump as a president. So I guess the question for you is, are, is the upper class, if it's not using the digitization, are they relying and their power on the upper, uh, on the lower and the middle classes, basically? So the comparative analysis of the, I don't see you, but okay, of the, of the media implications in politics, basically. Okay? Okay. Cool. Um, Professor Brklic. GDPR and its implications. Basically, is it the start or the end of our protection and data protection in the corporate and company world? And Professor Fatic, is it okay if people are choosing to give up their freedoms in sense of ach achieving more security on the governmental level? Um, CU was doing a great study in 2012, which was actually aiming off the terroristic frameworks and how, are, how is the European Union currently fighting terrorism, basically. So the question is, in the case in which we are fine with having all the cameras and CCTV, for example, which is, I think Amsterdam is leading currently regarding that, how fine is it for us to live under the scrutiny of the CCTV system in which we are choosing to have security achieved, and is the security actually being achieved in that sense? That's all for me, thanks. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, the article that I quoted, I think, uh, said, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I believe that it said that uh, eight hours was uh, the amount of, like the average time people from the lower classes spent in front of some kind of a screen. 
and five hours a day was, was the time related to the middle classes. Yeah, so it's a lot. It's really a lot. Uh, a nice group of, uh, of Russian artists uh, made, made this book like Digital Tarkovsky because they, they related the three hours uh, three hours people spend in front of their screens with, with, the, with the, like the, the length of a Tarkovsky movie and they're played with the implications of that. So the question of politics here is, is huge and the question about power relations too and um, there's something that Adam Greenfield, the author of Radical Technology said and I like that a lot. He said, uh, he said that, uh, that we are witnessing uh, the colonization of everyday life by information processing. And this is something we should uh, be more aware of. I don't think we are quite aware of that. And there is also something else, and it is something said by James Bridal, uh, that we are living in a world of exploding complexity, and no one like understands what's going on right now because there are so many data streams, and there are so many like different uh, different ways in which different technologies are intervening with natural and social processes, and uh, that makes it really hard to see what is going on. So in terms of politics and power and, uh, and digital technology, I remember, I remember Adam, Kerf, uh, Adam Curtis' uh, remark about how power today is being hidden within algorithms and media and uh, different financial processes and uh, you know, different technological processes and how it's much harder to see it nowadays than it was like, I don't know, couple of decades ago or a couple of centuries ago. So we need like new ways of seeing, like new ways of seeing these things, like new ways of seeing power relations. And uh, this is something where, I know, data visualization can help and this is something where different kinds of connections between media and technology can help. I don't know how in particular all these things work because these things are reinvented every day. But what I know is that the, the new Goebbelses of today are definitely something that has to do with artificial intelligence and propaganda, like artificial intelligence algorithms that like decide who is going to see what and who perform this pattern discrimination and who classify people and who do targeted advertising. Uh, that's something that's profoundly political and we need to be aware of how these things work we need to be aware of uh, who uses them to their own advantage. So this is a question of who stands to benefit. Like we talk about freedom on the internet. I don't really see that much of a freedom. During the 90s, we all dreamed about this like, I don't know, digital utopia of horizontal relationships and destroying hierarchies. And I don't see that anywhere. I see like the monopolies everywhere. I see really rigid social hierarchies being formed uh, by these technologies. So we need to understand them better. And we still don't understand them. We talk about it all the time, but we still don't understand it yet. Because it's really you know, hidden away from us. That's why we need conferences like this and questions like this. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to, I wanted to add on this as the American in the room. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, the, the standard statistics in terms of television viewing in the United States is about four and a half hours on average per day, and that's been pretty constant over the last several decades. The people that are watching eight hours a day are um, my demographic, um, older people, um, people who have not done cord cutting. The vast majority of younger people have done what's known as cord cutting, which is um, cutting their cable cord and therefore paying for services like Hulu, like Netflix, um, like HBO Go. So it's, it's people who can afford to pay for those, um, those pieces of information um, separately. The other thing I would add in terms, particularly in terms of polling, political polling in the United States, it is still done by telephone. And when I say telephone, I mean landline. Most people, younger people in the United States, don't have a landline. So when you see the kinds of political polls that are going on in the United States and they're, they're doing survey data, it's being done with people with landlines and those are going to particularly skew uh, more, more to the right, more Republican, more older. Thank you very much. Actually, I can, I can continue with uh, uh, answering your question based on what uh, Urosh and, and you just finished. Uh, 
So uh, your question about GDPR, I can make a long answer, I can make a short answer, uh, and I can make a right answer. And the right answer is no. Okay, that's not going to change. This is, um, and I'm not a pessimist about that, but the reason why I think it's not going to resolve the problem, maybe it can resolve some, some aspects of that, is that uh, actually the concept completely changed. We have now that by legal moves, we will change something which is already out of control. Uh, because what, we are living in a world where state as such is under control of capital. Big corporations now are basically new states. Whether you're an employee of Google and you have your cocoon where you are working in or not, or you are that customer who become product and now become raw material, uh, and, we are, and, and the next phase will be just by placing the information based on our profile, they're going to change our behavior, not just to follow it, but to change it. And we will not be aware of that. And if that technology already enables, how you think that some legal articles where you have to report this or that can change that, but you have the, how to say, the theater play that you're doing something that, that will resolve the problem. Not because the people who are implementing or who, who, who get this GDPR on place are wrong, but the system is not capable of resolving that issue. And on the other side, um, all of us, when we are, uh, where we are online, how to say that, every, we are all the time on the line, we give our permission to accept all those trash and information and, and, and data of that. Um, and because that state is under the control of capital already, that's what, how you can uh, see that. You can see that politic arena, political arena, becomes the entertain part of entertainment sector. There are the actors and actresses. There are telenovelas, there are thrillers. That's what we are seeing on political scene every day whether they are happening in Serbia or it's happening in the United States, which proved that it's a, it's a global phenomenon. How the system will change, that's the big challenge. And so Goran, Goran mentioned we have a completely different set of questions to resolve on our agenda, but here we will resolve with this, okay, we have now, you have to sign, you have blah, 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 things like that. Things were, uh, went under control and basically capital decides what's, what's happening on a political arena. And politicians are here to entertain us. And let's be fair, they are doing a very good job. <laughs> yes, of course, I had an example about Trump and Joe Biden. Maybe you saw that Joe Biden is uh, uh, now a part of the affair about misconducting some women in, in his uh, era of being vice president uh, to uh, Barack Obama, and Trump put a gif with Biden holding some, touching some uh, woman in, in his office. And uh, it was his way to say that he is uh, an opponent to, to maybe future candidate for American elections in 2020. So it is interesting how one really serious political debate can now become just a gif on Twitter. So I think that your, your uh, thesis that uh, uh, politicals are now our amusements are actually the, 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 the best way how we can really um, deal with them when we have an opportunity to, to make some decision in, in politi politic matters. They're, they're, they're playing, let me just finish with this, they're playing the roles which yes. they can, and, and think about that. Uh, from the moral standpoint and ethics standpoint, uh, it, it was not possible to imagine just 10 years ago that one day the politician says something and the other day completely different, it doesn't matter. Now it doesn't yes. matter. Because they are playing a new role every day and that's fine with the audience because that's the, how they accept what yes, they are they doing. Train that's us how for they that. can go through that. And uh, here in Serbia we can be very proud that basically the trends we are seeing in Serbia are the global trends. So yes. we are on the good level, so that's perfect. <laughs> I will keep that way, believe me. Yes, thank you. Any more questions? Yes, uh, I, I think I think I, oh, I I'm sorry, I'm sorry, answers. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, third one. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, it being justifiable for us to give up a part of our individual liberty, privacy, etc., in, in exchange for greater security, uh, 
There are all kinds of well-tested answers to this question. I mean, the Norwegian theorist uh, Ole Weaver came with this concept of securitization, and, and he argued that one way that governments uh, successfully pursue increasing controls of the citizens is to present an increasing number of issues as security issues. And this process is called securitization. What, what used to be improper behavior is now threatening behavior. What used to be an insult is now a security issue par excellence. In this country, uh, over the past six months, the largest number of people who have been brought in for questioning by the police have been the people who have apparently threatened someone on social networks. And there's been a debate in social sciences, not just in this country but elsewhere, about this increasing securitization of the threatening in verbal communication. And some have argued, and, 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 and I sort of have a liking for this position, some have argued that you know, threats are in, an integral part of human communication. You know, we all threaten each other in direct or indirect ways. You know, the law threatens us. You know, there's a text in the law which says, you know, for this kind of behavior, this kind of sanction is threatened in Serbia. In Serbian, there's, there's, there's the phrase, zaprećena kazna. So uh, there's nothing in the concept of a threat which is in itself uh, a security issue. So this is just a small example. So, so I'm not really sure that, that giving up any kind of personal liberty in exchange for uh, 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 what, what may or may not be an increased level of security is, is justified. But let me go back to the concept, very briefly, to the concept of the community. You know, I work at the state university and I work at this university at the same time. And when I walk into the state university here, people behave to me in a certain way. And this is a large university. People behave in a relatively cold and distant way. And when I walk into this faculty, people behave in a very different way, in a very friendly, kind, nice way. And this is because of the two different cultures. Now, I, a big part of the reason that I work in this faculty is this kind of atmosphere. It means to me because it, it, it feeds my childish desire for a return to a community in the age of digitization. Now, if there were cameras all around and everybody working at this faculty was required to behave nicely under the threat of sanction and people behaved in exactly the same way as they behave now, I would not have that added value of believing that they actually have a virtue and that they have chosen to behave in a constructive way to me. And by increasing surveillance controls and you know, uh, 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 provision of this illusion of, of, of oversight and, 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 and increased security, uh, uh, the state is basically taking away our prerogative of virtue. It is reducing our free will, our ability to choose. If you have an organic community, you must have a degree of freedom to do something improper. Otherwise, you're doing proper things has no value. So uh, I, I think that is perhaps theoretically the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Sorry, we have a first. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, well, um, I, w I will try to be concise. Okay, everybody's turning <laughs> around. Um, um, I want to say that I, I have a problem that you, for all four of you, are a bit different aspects, and I agree with everyone uh, a bit. Uh, so my question would be some kind of mix for Mr. Kuchedinac Brkljac and Mr. Fatic, and uh, it's about the trust on one uh, on one hand, and on the other hand about this urge to have more conferences and talk more about these things. And um, I find myself as both digital and organic person. And uh, the problem is when we, okay, we need to talk about data, about conference, about digital, but how we have a trust in you, for example, in four of you, because you are all invited based on some labels that you have, that you are some professor or you are, uh, I don't know, a digital native or something. And we should trust you and we should trust the thing you say, but on the other hand, if I don't like you on physical appearance or I don't agree, then I would be very skeptical. 
So uh, my question would be how to overcome that someone we should trust based on their labels and their achievements in professional digital society to just transfer it to organic trust and that in this, let's say, uh, mutual debate in uh, both in Serbia or globally or whatever, we can actually trust someone both on organic and digital way and to see, yes, this person knows what he's talking about and it's not bad, it's not here because it's paid to say that. So that would be some mutual question for all of you. <laughs> Who wants to try first? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, my, my, my first answer would be short and it is um, don't trust us. <laughs> Please don't. Uh, but the longer answer would be I think uh, we need to, you know, trust our own guts on that. We need to cultivate our guts. We need to cultivate our intuitions, our sensibilities. We need to, you know, realize what we as humans are able to think and feel about other humans. Machines are not going to help us on that. We need to cultivate our communities. We need to cultivate, uh, you know, the way we exchange things. All these things uh, are, are, you know, now are, they are mediated by the system. That's something Professor said. But we need to find new ways of how to uh, mediate them by ourselves. We need to reclaim uh, our, we need to reclaim trust of our own guts. That would be a, my answer. Well, uh, uh, here about the trust and appearance and everything, that's why I dress nicely. I mean, that's the reason, okay? Uh, the, uh, I mean, it's always, th that question of trust is a key question, so it's a very, very great uh, question. In a physical world, it's one set of skills you have to start trusting or, or not trusting. Here, because basically our digital life is more present than our real life, I think uh, our, this digital life has already become real life. And that's why the, this question of trust is so problematic because you can play with that, how to earn uh, that, that trust. And uh, because of that, my answer to your question is don't trust us. Yes, uh, I think <clears throat> I think uh, people who uh, uh, appeal to their position, to their professorship, to their age, to their position of government authority, and whatever kind of positional power, uh, in order to elicit trust, shouldn't be trusted. So uh, uh, generally, uh, those few people who trust me, uh, they don't trust me because I'm a professor, because. They, they simply trust me because I'm handsome and charismatic. Uh, but, but I'm not asking you to trust me, and I, I don't think any of us here asked you to trust us. In fact, we have tried to uh, sort of cause you to reconsider some things. Uh, we have tried to uh, uh, prod you into questioning some things. And that is the role of educators. The role of educators is not to profess. Professors don't profess, just as counselors don't counsel. Professors try to elicit wonder. And people learn by wondering about things and, about, and by, by coming to their own conclusions. So I don't think trust is so crucial in, trust in what we say is so crucial as in, in, in the process of, of education. And, and this is not strictly a process of education. This is a free exchange of ideas, a conference. Now, uh, uh, organic trust. How, how do we build organic trust? We can't build organic trust. Uh, Hughes Lehner has this story in his book, which I will share with you very briefly. He says that he often drives through the woods of Montana, uh, uh, and apparently there are fruit stalls around the ro along the road. And, and these are very long roads, and it doesn't pay for people to man the stalls. So basically, there's fruit in the stalls, uh, there's a price written down, and people are expected to simply weigh the fruit, leave the appropriate amount of money, and go away. And apparently, theft is an exceptionally rare thing. Now. Are there strategic, rational reasons to believe that people driving through the woods of Montana, coming from all kinds of places, from all parts of 
the U.S., potentially coming from all parts of the U.S., will all be honest and nobody will steal. No. But there's a culture among the owners of the stalls that you should generally trust people, and it pays. So we need to understand that organic trust cannot be built. Organic trust can only be betrayed. Organic trust is a virtue. And it says, I will trust everyone whom I meet unless they betray my trust. The opposite of this is strategic trust, which is prevalent, and it implies that I will not trust anyone until they earn my trust. And we choose which kind of person we will be between those two options. I would just like to add one thing. Uh, I would like to add one thing, and it relates to the, to the culture of blockchain, because it's something, you know, within these blockchain communities, there's a lot of talk about trust. And when we talk about this strategic trust, I would say that the most extreme form of strategic trust is the blockchain trust. Uh, and there exists this, uh, this libertarian, utopian idea that we can somehow uh, delegate trust to these computer systems, these distributed computer systems. So trust would, would, uh, would become some form of cryptographic torrenting. Uh, and uh, I think that it's, uh, it's naive and it's something that should be questioned and we should talk more about that. And I agree with, uh, with what Professor said, because in the end, uh, you know, if you don't trust people, life is crappy. And um, the idea that technology is going to solve these problems, that technology is going to provide means of uh, uh, not uh, thinking about should we trust other people or not, it's really naive. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think we need, uh, we need more... Uh, we need more, uh, yeah, trust in our guts, and we need more. We need more poetry. I just wanted to um, to join the debate on the trust because I think we are missing another element here. Because for change to happen, these horizontal communities, exceptionally important, trust exceptionally important. But there's another element because people trust elites and people trust each other, but elites don't trust. Elites fear. And if we are talking about the fear of the elites, we, it, that's another case where we should also step away from the digital. There's been a lot of narratives about the digital role, play, uh, role of digital networks in Arab Spring and so on. But it's actually the other way around. It's the bodies that, change, that make political change. I've been for, for last month completely devoured and into the, this uh, cable car gondola fight. We have met with all the ministers and press and everything. And it, f when you started, you were like, yeah, I'm just going to paste it on, post it on Facebook and everyone's going to... But, you know, these things, there's a revolution per day on Facebook. But real revolutions happen when people move their bodies, when they go to meetings, when they go to media, when they go to the streets. So I think this is really, really important to reevaluate our bodies and our guts and our flesh as a political tool, not only clicking, but also walking, lying down, and so on. So I think this is really, uh, fear is also not necessarily a negative thing. It's a tool for change. Thank you. Uh, you had a question? Uh, yes. OK, so uh, my question is specifically for Orosh. Um, so considering the fact that uh, lower classes tend to spend more time online, uh, I have a uh, like great pre uh, preoccupation because of that. Like the rich decided to send their people, uh, their children to schools that don't have, uh, that don't have the digital, that don't have the internet. They tried to educate them in more standard ways, more. Uh, uh, how would you say conservative ways? Whereas uh, I mean, not all of them. It's it's like a statistical thing. It's a trend. Yes, it's yes. Like but uh, the thing that fear uh, that I'm afraid of the most is uh, the way algorithms that are online shape people, shape individuals, especially those of the lower class, since they spend most time online. So basically, uh, all search engines and social media have algorithms that feed us content, information uh, that they think we would like. They connect us with the people they think we would like. 
So uh, my question is, uh, would that bring to a bigger class divide? Where, uh, where we have a lower class that is uh, shaped, that is taught by an algorithm, by a computer, basically, whereas, you, uh, whereas the people that spend less time online would get m less information from, from algorithms, basically. Well, uh, I'm afraid that this is one of the scenarios that we are about to witness if we don't, you know, uh, use our bodies as a, as a political tool, as a, as a colleague said. So, yeah, I think this digital divide is actually not so simple as we think. Like, you know, uh, powerful, they use technology all the time, and, you know, the poor, they're not using it at all. I think it's, it's, uh, there, are, there are subtleties and nuances here. Yeah, and, and this, this question of algorithmic propaganda, it, it's huge. I don't know what to do about it because it's really big and these uh, this technologies move really fast. And uh, I would lie if I would offer any kind of solution to that. I think we definitely need more thinking. We need more articulation. We need more reflection. We need, more, uh, we need less trust on technology itself. We need less technological solutionism. We need less of this, this illusion that a new startup is going to solve a problem. And this is something that we need. And, and I witnessed a lot because of my technological background. I witnessed a lot of brilliant young people coming into, into software industry, dreaming about changing society uh, through a startup and through a new company. And sometimes it does happen, but most often it does not. Most often these startups uh, end up being like completely free research and development uh, departments for larger companies, you know, to take over their ideas in the end. So very, very little amount of people actually, uh, actually got rich from all of that and powerful. And, and the class divide is growing stronger. And we still don't know what to do about that. And this is one of the questions I think are the key questions of today. What to do about the, the raging, widening class, uh, class um, inequalities. Yeah, thank you. Well, it is interesting how in the societies which are in transitions, you can always hear, hear uh, rich and digital together. But it actually, we, uh, we all use digital technologies and uh, most of us uh, can't say that we are rich because, you know. Five minutes, okay. Uh, two questions and short questions. I think I have a right because I have a <laughs> microphone. Sorry for the joke. Actually, uh, I think that the basic question is, uh, uh, was the human society worldwide was ready for the digital age? And the problem is that uh, uh, Thank you. So the point is that uh, uh, despite the most of you who uh, actually analyzed and uh, 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 are involved uh, in, in uh, analytics, I was the part of the people who created this because I was in mobile ecosystem since 1995. And if he took a uh, presence, uh, uh, circumstances that everything is based on the smartphone, which is number one screen almost the last three years. So this, the question is what we get. And uh, my answer is already that uh, we was not ready and that uh, we get the many uh, abuse of technology. And I think that the most of uh, you uh, already pointed this. I would just uh, give uh, two or three short uh, points uh, what can help for answers. On first uh, place is that uh, some of the futurists told that actually everything what we are doing uh, today uh, is uh, the preparation for the new era when uh, human society would have a lot of time and that's something who mentioned entertainment. It's a, uh, already three American states, uh, they already have uh, fully uh, uh, used uh, autonomous driving vehicle. So it means that uh, after three, five, ten years, you can start to count all drivers worldwide uh, without job. The second thing is that uh, robotics uh, became cheaper and cheaper. And that means that after the next uh, five to ten years, you would have such number of uh, robots deployed in industry, that in manufacturing. That is the question, what to do with all these workers? If you're looking for e-government, 
That is the question. What all the, these bureaucratics would they are doing with you when you can get all by the one click of the computer? So uh, the question is also uh, in this entertainment, uh, the, the problem is the society didn't respond, uh, respond uh, positively, meaning that we took the best things. And the point is that uh, we don't have uh, at the moment uh, right answer because the global uh, problem is the, the all uh, societies uh, suffer the same problems. And just for the end, if you're looking at uh, e-sport, look at the, the kids who play the e-sport, are they the sportsmen? But the point is that uh, we have, sorry, was I finished. The point is that uh, all together uh, we have the same problem and uh, the question is still, uh, was we ready for the digital uh, society and what was our response? Thank you. Well, uh, we yeah. came to the end, so um, uh, probably uh, The question is actually time. why do we have time to answer that question, but actually I think that your question may be answered in the last two sessions after the lunch, simply because both Mara and Andrew are going to be talking exactly uh, many of the facets and the aspects of, um, let's say, trust and control. We, that's kind of deliberately why we had the word trust on the <coughs> on, on kind of main screen, uh, because it is a kind of huge, huge issue. And what you said, whether technology is getting abused, or as Gary Vee kind of once said, that technology is actually revealing us uh, and giving us the opportunity to, to, to show more of the kind of what we may call human nature. But um, there's kind of lots of things that we can talk about definitely, such a rich kind of huge, huge territory. And we're talking about the change, civilizational changes, basically. I would leave that for the fireside chat if you're okay as well, because we've got the opportunity to go into many, many more details with kind of all the people who are here today. Um, and if that's okay, Danica? Of course. We can wrap it up. So once again, uh, a big applause for, for our panel, for Uros, Bane, uh, Goran, and Alexander. And Thanks again to Danny Cicigoya who, who are moderating.